you know, you've been very critical. You signed a letter that was in Harper's Magazine, critical about cancel culture, what's sometimes called wokeness, or overusing critical race theory to teach kids in high school. And yet recently, you signed something and wrote something against conservative state legislatures that are trying to ban critical race theory. Explain to me why you changed on that. Well, I think it's uh, not a change really at all. I think it's just sticking with a fundamental principle, which is that, you know, a bedrock of any type of freedom is the freedom of expression, the freedom to um, think freely, to explore ideas, and to discuss ideas that are controversial and that are potentially even wrong. And the way to defeat wrong ideas is through persuasion and through superior ideas and clearer thinking. But it's not through any kind of authoritarianism or, or, or bans or undemocratic um, means of forcing people um, to think the same. So, you know, the Harper's letter was a defense of freedom of expression and uh, the op-ed that Jason Stanley of Yale, Camille Foster and David French and I um, wrote in the New York Times uh, was arguing that, you know, um, banning ideas that we think are unpersuasive is, is, a, is a really bad way about going about uh, defending so-called liberal principles. But don't you think that parents, you know, when they're faced with their kids coming home saying, here's what they're teaching me at school, at some point they have a right to say, wait, wait, that's going too far? Yeah, I, I absolutely think they have a right to say that. And I think that's where persuasion comes in and that's where um, discussion comes in. But, you know, the, one of the problems with these types of bans is that it's very difficult to pinpoint what is this thing that's being banned and what is actually outside of that. And so you have these huge kind of um, mistakes being made where a letter from a Birmingham jail by Martin Luther King is being banned because it's potential to make um, white students uncomfortable or, you know, texts that um, are, 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 are key to understanding, you know, the racial history of the United States of America, which frankly is an uncomfortable history, are being banned and we're in danger of sugarcoating, um, I think, conversations that need to be a little bit um, difficult to digest. One of the common themes of these laws is that they say uh, that we shouldn't have things that make kids feel uncomfortable about their race. Is there an advantage to having kids feel slightly guilty about their race? Well, you know, I, I probably disagree with uh, at least one of my co-authors um, on, on, on that. I, I think that we have a huge mistake in this country about how we go about um, indoctrinating children uh, and each other into um, believing in these abstract categories of racial classification to begin with. So I think that we're in the process of educating children into thinking of themselves as white, thinking of themselves as black, and then there are a lot of problems that come out of this that, that, that are all, uh, you know, I, I think a, a more fundamental solution to the problem is to actually find ways to transcend the, the mistake of race in the first place. Do you think that the Democratic Party uh, has been hurt by its association with what some call wokeness, or is that a whole bunch of gibberish? No, I, it's, a, it's an interesting question because there is gibberish and there is um, something there. Um, the Democratic Party has had a difficult time standing up to, I think, um, its, its most, um, its loudest and its, and its most um, visible niche uh, fringe. So the, the, the kind of voices that dominate social media, the voices that dominate Twitter, and that therefore catch the attention of um, a lot of the media class are not actually representative of even most of the minority constituents of the Democratic Party. And so there's a, there's a kind of mistaken belief that um, more of the Democratic base is woker than it actually is. So I think that that has actually hurt um, politically Democrats, that they've, 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 they've veered too far to a kind of progressive worldview that is not shared by n not even most of the country, but not most of their own voters. Now you come from a mixed race background. How does that help inform your thinking about not categorizing people by race? Well. 
my personal experiences have made my belief in um, racial classification uh, fall apart. I, I, having children who I know are descended from Africa and are descended from Europe and that the world perceives as, as, as white, but I know could have been enslaved in another time in America. I mean, it makes these, these walls of identity fall down around me. I, I see individuals, I see complex human beings with, with, with mixed up histories. And I know that um, many other people share this kind of uh, uh, interconnectedness that we seem to deny when we, when we fall back on um, I, I, what I would call, you know, the, the, the myth of race, the, the, the veil of race that falls between us when, we, when I see you and I think I see something and I, and I deny the complexity of the individual underneath the story that I tell myself about you. And I don't mean to deny racism or the history of oppression that exists in this country, but I mean to say that to transcend that kind of racism, we're going to at some point have to transcend uh, racial thinking. And, and this is what the kind of uh, anti-CRT bans and the kind of uh, anti-racism that focuses on racial difference both uh, neglect to do. And that's why I think we stay in this impasse. You know, about 10 years ago, you wrote that you're from a mixed race background, but you had, I think you used the phrase, ethical obligation to identify as black. Uh, what made you change? The birth of my first child did. Um, you know, I, I, I wrote that up that in the New York Times arguing that um, race wasn't biologically meaningful, but that it was uh, essentially ethically meaningful. Um, and, and, and I really couldn't defend that when I thought about how I might send um, my child out into the world and teach her what essentially was the logic of, of, of the slave owner, the logic of the plantation that um, even though no one could perceive it, a drop of black blood made her black and that she must present herself in the world as black. And I didn't want to send her out into the world saying, therefore I'm white. I wanted to send her out into the world saying that these are not categories that are meaningful for me, that I have both of these histories in me. Um, but these are not, these are not, these are not biologically meaningful and we have to find a new language for, for what is culturally and what is politically and what is socially meaningful. You've been a great defender of the classics, Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, uh, even though some have said, you know, that's imposing sort of a white Western narrative on a multicultural society. First off, tell me about your father, you know, growing up black in Galveston, Texas, being turned on to the classics and how that affected your thinking. My father, uh, lived on, uh, he was born in 1937, grew up in Galveston, Texas, um, segregated uh, part of town and a neighbor of his, there was a pile of books that he found on the neighbor's property. And one of the books was Will Durant's The Story of Philosophy. Um, my father was quite young, under 10 years old. And he says that he just was flipping through the book and he saw this image of Socrates and that he was transfixed by it. And he was trying to understand how this guy's face, which was not a remarkable face, it was actually a kind of funny looking face, how it was something important enough to be preserved in a book uh, across all these years. And so, you know, this led him to reading Plato's dialogues at some point. And, uh, you know, th this was a lifeline for him. Um, at that point in, in time, I mean, my father's identity was telling him that he was a second class citizen. And the ideas that he encountered in these texts were telling him that his humanity was far more expansive than that. And so this was the first uh, step in a lifelong, lifelong process of, uh, um, of transcending the parochial, the local, and getting in touch with you know, the universal. And this is the, this is the message that my father always instilled in, in me and that you know, I think is very important to uphold at this kind of time in the culture wars where everything becomes hyperpolarized and everything becomes a matter of um, what, 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 what represents me, what is, what is speaking to me directly as a, the classics and this kind of transcendent power, this liberatory power of an education, um, it, 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 it breaks down those barriers 